So welcome to this KubeCon presentation about uh, how you use V cluster, cross-plane, and Argo CD for multi-tenancy. Uh, I'm Kostis Kapelonis. I'm working as a developer advocate at CodeFresh. And with me, I have Ilya, a DevOps engineer at CodeFresh. And the problem we are going to talk about today is how we provided hosted Argo CD instances to the masses. Uh, we both work for CodeFresh. It's a software delivery platform. It has a CI, CD, and GitOps component. If you want to know more about CodeFresh, we have a booth outside. But today, we're going to talk about a very specific problem that we wanted to solve. So customers can go to the CodeFresh website. They sign up. Uh, they open an account with us. And then after some minutes, they get an Argo CD instance for them, just for them, created for them. It's open to everybody, so we don't know how many users uh, we have in advance. And it's, it's, it should be fully automated. We don't want to open a ticket to create a cluster for them. We don't want them to send an email. We want to, to be completely self-serve. So that's a problem we wanted to, to solve and essentially give uh, an Argo instance to, to everybody, if you know the meme. So what are the possible solutions? Uh, if you are familiar with Argo CD, Argo CD on its own has an installation mode where you install it on a namespace. So you split in the, the installation into two parts. First, you install the CRDs only on the parent cluster. And then for each namespace, you install an Argo CD instance that works only on that namespace. And after you do that, the customers come in and they can connect their own clusters to, this, to their own Argo CD instance. So essentially, each customer has a namespace on a shared uh, cluster. Now, this could work in theory. It's very easy for us because we have a single cluster. It's uh, centralized. It's also resource efficient. We can use all the auto-scaling methods that we have for Kubernetes. Creating a namespace is uh, super fast, so it's very easy for customers to get what they want right away. Uh, but it's not secure by default. So there is no isolation between namespaces. We need to set up policies, uh, set up quotas, do something for isolation. You also have the usual problems with um, resource starvation. If somebody is doing something that uh, gets stuck, the whole system will have issues. And also specifically for us, because we are installing Argo CD and we want its tenant to get Argo CD, Argo CD has its own CRD, so we would have um, problems because we can only use one CRD for everybody, one CRD instance. So essentially, everybody is locked to the same cluster version and the same Argo CD version, which maybe it's not the optimal way to do things. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we could say, OK, let's give each customer their own cluster. So as soon as somebody signs up, we launch a cluster just for them. We install an Argo CD instance on the cluster, and then we give them full access uh, to, the, to this cluster. So this model is a customer per cluster. Now, on the one hand, we get total isolation. Everybody owns their own cluster, and they can do whatever they want. Uh, we are also free to do different versions. So if somebody wants a different Kubernetes version or a different Argo CD version, we can do it. We don't have any conflicts with um, Argo CD CRDs. So as far as the customers are concerned, it's perfect for them. But for us, it's super expensive creating a cluster for each uh, customer. Remember, I said we don't know how many customers uh, we have in advance. Uh, creating a cluster is super slow. For some cloud providers, it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And it would be also difficult for us. Like we would have so many clusters, and we would need a, um, an easy way to manage them. So these are, these are the two choices that we had to make. Uh, and essentially, you can see that nothing is perfect. Each one has advantages and disadvantages. And somebody might say, OK, cost is more interesting for me, so I will pick this one. Or uh, scalability is more interesting for me, so I will pick uh, that one. But there isn't like a clear uh, winner. Uh, specifically in our case, because Argo CD is not just an application, but it's an application where you um, connect target deployment clusters. So this would be super secure, because if somebody gets access, a tenant gets access to the Argo CD instance of another tenant, not only they get access to the Argo CD instance itself, but also to all the clusters that somebody might have connected there. So a security uh, issue would compromise the clusters of the customers as well, not only our own uh, infrastructure. So we said maybe there is a third option, and this is when we discovered uh, vCluster. So vCluster, if you're not familiar with it, it's an open source project. Um, there is a website at vcluster.com. They also have the source code at GitHub. It's managed by Loft Labs, and essentially it gives you the capability to deploy a cluster within a cluster. It's clusters all the way down, clusterception. And it's fully Kubernetes compliant, and we're going to talk about this. So in this model, we have a root cluster like before. 
but on each namespace, we deploy another Kubernetes cluster, like a real Kubernetes cluster. You have many choices. You can install um, K3S, K0S, and I think even EKS. And it's a real Kubernetes cluster that passes all the compatibility tests like any other Kubernetes uh, cluster. It has its own API, uh, fully compatible with standard Kubernetes. Then we install an Argo CD instance there. An Argo CD thinks it's in a real cluster, but it's not. Each Argo CD instance gets its own CRD, so it's a standard installation, not the namespace one. And then from that, that point onwards, the process is the same. Customers come in and they connect their own clusters. So this third choice is a bit better because we get the best from both worlds. We have good isolation. I'm not saying perfect, and we will see why. Each customer thinks they have full access to a cluster. It's cost effective for us because we still have one parent cluster and we can do auto scaling and um, make sure that everybody has the resources that they have. There is no problem with CRDs or conflicts um, anymore. It's very easy to share resources if we want. Creating a virtual cluster is um, faster than creating a, a real cluster and maybe not as fast as creating a namespace, but still real fast. And it's very easy for us to give capabilities to the customer if they want a different Argo CD version or even if they want a different Kubernetes version. So if it's possible that the parent cluster is, let's say, 1.24, but the virtual cluster inside has a different version. Uh, there are some issues. You need to do some hardening, so it's not perfect. And you still have a single point of failure. So if the parent cluster breaks for some reason, you lose all the uh, children clusters. So that's the theory. And now Ilya will talk about the implementation. OK, hello. So we'll get a little, a little bit technical. Now let's look at the solution architecture from uh, above a little bit. So we have our host cluster. Inside our host cluster, we deploy a namespace for each customer. Inside this namespace, we deploy vCluster. And onto the vCluster, we deploy the virtual Argo CD. So, uh, and to this Argo CD, the customer then connects their own target clusters and the Argo CD sinks the resources onto their clusters. Now, this is how the architecture looks in general. Now, let's dive uh, into the components. Now, let's explore some vCluster concepts and how vClusters operate and, and deployed. So vClusters are deployed onto the host cluster like any other Kubernetes manifest, like any other workload. You can use, you can use plain manifest. You can use the, their official Helm chart. And V clusters are entirely namespace scoped, so you wouldn't require a cluster admin privileges to deploy uh, the V cluster. And the way they operate is that high level resources are entirely virtual. They exist only the real, in the realm of the V cluster in its API. And the low level resources that are absolutely necessary to, act, to execute workloads like pods, like secrets, config maps you know, map into the pods they exist on the host cluster and they're synced by the syncer, which we'll see in the next slide, onto the host cluster. So this is how vClusters operate. They have, uh, you have the vCluster pod. Uh, the the uh, vCluster pod has two containers. One is the vCluster itself, which represents the Kubernetes API. And there is the syncer container, which is responsible for syncing API objects from the vCluster onto the host cluster. And uh, basically, it syncs, by default, it will sync only the absolutely necessary resources, like secrets, config maps, pods, et cetera, what I said before. But you can also configure it to sync any other resource you might want. For example, uh, ingresses, if you want uh, vCluster workloads to be accessed from outside. So like any SaaS solution, especially our solution, because we don't know how many customers we will have, and how many of those V clusters we will need to provision, uh, we need to worry about scaling and uh, proper automation. And so to deploy a single instance of our virtual Argo CD, we need to deploy two things. We need to deploy the Helm tray for V cluster, and then we need to, onto this V cluster, we need to deploy the uh, manifest for the virtual Argo CD. But the challenge here is that V cluster is, uh, has its own Cube API. So it's not just like, deploying any other uh, two Helm releases side by side. So basically, you need to deploy the vCluster. You need to get the kube config from the vCluster. You need to deploy the Argo CD onto the vCluster. So if we look at this in a different way, uh, the vCluster is actually a piece of infrastructure. It's like I would 
deploy an EKS cluster in, in, uh, in AWS or in Azure, whatever, and I would want to deploy some workloads onto it automatically. So this takes us to the realm of the infrastructure provisioning tools. And here comes uh, Crossplane. So we were looking for a, a Kubernetes native solution to deploy all this. And what Crossplane does is it, it utilizes Kubernetes to serve as a general purpose control loop, which means you can use Kubernetes to manage any type of resource. As long as there is an API you can access and create this resource by some controller, you can manage it with Crossplane. So you can manage any non-Kubernetes resource. Even pizza orders, as we will see in uh, one of the next slides. So you get uh, one control plane to rule them all. So how does uh, Crossplane provision infrastructure? Crossplane uses, uh, it's a very, very simplified way of, this, uh, of describing Crossplane, but Crossplane uses uh, providers and resources. Resources are represented using Kubernetes CRDs, and are, and are describing the resources that we want to create. For example, if we want to create an AWS VPC, we will have a spec that, for example, would have uh, Cedar blocks. And providers are the actual Kubernetes controllers that are responsible for creating those resources on the third-party APIs. Uh, so for AWS, we would use AWS provider. Provider configs are, uh, those are the configurations that define how the provider should create the resources. For example, they would have authentication. They would reference a secret that would authenticate me against AWS. So here is a simple example of using Crossplane to provision infrastructure. On the left-hand side, we have the provider, which is the, it defines that we are using AWS provider. The provider config defines the credentials we would use to access AWS API. And the VPC is the actual resource that we are going to create. And you can see it under its spec. It has a region, it has a cedar block, it has tags, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the most powerful features of Crossplane is the possibility to create compositions and composite resources. What that means is that we can create our own CRD that would utilize multiple providers uh, and create our own kind of resource. For example, if my uh, Kubernetes cluster needs to, needs to include Argo CD in it, so I would use, uh, if, and I want to provision it on, uh, on uh, gcloud, I would use the Google Cloud provider to provision the GKE cluster, and I would use, for example, the Helm provider to deploy Argo CD onto it. And I would call this like my cluster, and whoever wants to create one of those will create a resource claim, and they will be able to, de to deploy such a cluster. And there is such an example in the Crossplane repo. You can access it later. And the presentation is, of course, uh, uploaded to the CNCF website. So, and if you want to learn how to order a pizza from Domino's with Crossplane, you can scan this QR code. It will take you to their blog post. It's a really nice blog post. So the guy basically created uh, a controller that accesses the Domino's API. And by accident, he, he made a mistake and ordered like half a dozen of pizzas. <laughs> so let's see how it all comes together for uh, our solution in Coldfresh. So when a new hosted uh, Argo CD is deployed, our platform commits a resource claim of the type uh, hosted runtime, which, which, which is how we call our uh, virtual Argo CDs. It deploys it into a Git repository. There is an Argo CD on the host cluster that syncs those resources onto the host cluster. And there we have the, the cross claim composition that utilizes mainly one provider, which is the Helm provider. It deploys the V cluster uh, Helm release. It then creates a provider config. Yes, you can also use uh, cross plane compositions to create cross plane resources. So the provider config has the kube config for the V cluster, and then we use that to deploy our Argo CD onto this V cluster. So uh, how does the end user experience look? A user would go into our UI, they would click install hosted runtime, and they would see this nice progress bar, everybody loves those. And once uh, this is done, they will see that the hosted runtime is active, and they can see their components, 
And once they're connect, once the target clusters are connected, they can create Argo applications and sync resources to their target clusters. So what are the benefits? The benefits for the users, of course, are that they get uh, one-click installation, Argo CD instance, zero configuration, zero trouble, and they have flexibility in managing multiple Argo CDs, uh, Argo CD versions and Kubernetes versions. They get a friendly management UI and enterprise-grade SSO and all those stuff. And how does it benefit us at Coldfresh? So we have a centralized setup. It's very cost-effective. The cluster grows and shrinks if customers join. It grows if, they, if we shut down runtimes, they shrink back. Uh, we get security isolation out of the box. We don't need to worry about isolating pods so they don't access other namespaces. And it allows us to have different combinations of uh, Kubernetes and Argo CD versions. So we can test out, for example, new versions of uh, Argo CD without affecting uh, other customers. And how do we monitor all this? Because pods provisioned by vClusters are available on the host cluster, you can basically use your uh, favorite tools that you use to manage your Kubernetes workloads. And we use the Prometheus and Grafana stacks. So everything is like scrapable. We can scrape the sl slash metrics endpoints, and we get all the metrics that we would get as if everything was running without vClusters. In addition, we built our own proprietary exporter to monitor the uh, runtime health from the platform side. It's some business metrics and to know whether it's synced and like how many of those we have. So let's see how it looks. Uh, this is a Grafana dashboard that uh, represents the health of a single hosted runtime. At the bottom, we can see the low key and a dashboard from Loki that shows the logs from all the components that we have inside. And we, have, we can see the pods, all their logs, their statuses, whatever you would do for pods. And this is the dashboard from the proprietary exporter. You can see that at this point in time when we took the screenshot, we had 64 active runtimes. They were all synced and they were all, all healthy. Okay, so now it's time to show a little demo. And because, uh, because Upbound are sponsoring the Wi-Fi for this event, I'm gonna YOLO it and do it live. <laughs> so let's hope Upbound, they own Crossplane, by the way. Who doesn't know? Okay, so the demo is inside this repository. You can access it by scanning the QR code or, or, or clicking the link. And there is a readme with, with instructions on how you can run this demo yourself with a few easy steps, and let's do it. So in the demo, I'm going to show like, behind the scenes how it looks when we provision and deprovision hosted Argo CDs. And so here we see the repo. Let's go over it a little bit. We have three folders, Argo CD applications, cross plane resources, and virtual Argo CDs. So let's start from Crossplane resources. We have here all the resources that are required for our setup for Crossplane. So we have the Helm provider, uh, Kubernetes provider I use for a small thing so the uh, namespace gets deployed and uh, removed, and the composition for the virtual Argo CD, which is the most interesting part, which consists of the definition, how the CRD looks, and the composition. In the composition, we will define uh, for, uh, the, a list of resources. I can even try and show that. So we have uh, a list of resources, like one is the B cluster release, and then we would have uh, the observe delete namespace and provider config for Helm on the B cluster. And of course, the last one would be the Argo CD on, on the B cluster. And so this is the cross plane resources part. And we see we, uh, the other folder is the virtual Argo CDs. The virtual Argo CDs is where we hold the uh, resource claims for those uh, compositions. So basically, this is what we, where we would hold the, our customer uh, Argo CDs. A every instance that they would, would be created would be created here. So at this point in time, we have customer one, which is currently deployed, and we'll see it in a moment. And we have customer two, which is commented out. 
Okay, Argo CD applications folder contains the manifest for the Argo CD applications. We have three. We'll show, I'll show them in Argo CD. So the first one is Crossplane, which is basically just a Helm release, the official Helm release for Crossplane. Crossplane resources is syncing the folder with the manifest uh, that we saw earlier. And Virtual Argo CDs syncs the other folder. Okay. And let's look at Virtual Argo CDs. At this, uh, at this moment, it looks like this. We have one customer, one Virtual Argo CD, which interpolates into three resources, the provider config and two Helm releases. Okay. Let's add another customer and see what's going to happen. And go back and go into Virtual Argo CDs folder. Uncommon this. Commit. Go to Argo CD. Refresh it. And we should immediately see that customer 2 was added. And let's look at and see what happens inside the cluster. We can see that a new namespace was deployed for customer 2. And inside, we can see the V cluster starting to spin up. This is the V cluster pod. And V cluster also includes uh, core DNS deployment for uh, name resolution. Now, once that starts, the composition will know that uh, V cluster is deployed and it can start deploying the Argo CD. In a moment, we should see Argo CD start, starting to get deployed. Okay, so we can start, we start to see the pods for Argo CD being deployed. And if we check and see for deployments in this namespace, we for sure know the Argo CD has deployments and it's all empty. Why is it empty? Because deployments are high level resources. And if we execute into the vCluster pod and do kubectl minus n Argo CD get deployment, we can see they're all here inside the V cluster realm. Okay. So now let's try and remove our customer and see what the, what happens next. Go here, comment it out, commit, sync Argo CD again. Okay, we can see it disappeared. And if we look at the namespace, it's all getting removed. And in a second, the namespace will also disappear. Okay. So provisioning and deprovisioning works. And, uh, and, the Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi hasn't failed us. So we, here we have some resources for you to, if you want to learn more, you can go to, the, to vclaster.com by Loft. And you can read the entire documentation for vcluster there. And crosspen.io, also at appon.io, at if you want to learn more about uh, uh, crossplane. And on our website, we have a training for an Argo CD certification that you can go and have a look at. And if you want to give us feedback, we would really appreciate that. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer now. And you can also find us at the Code Fresh booth later. <laughs> yes. Can you? Testing. Hi. Um, so, since everything is deployed, like V cluster is deployed using Helm charts, and you deploy that using Crossplane, how do you make sure you don't someone doesn't accidentally delete all the V clusters and all the Argo CDs in it? How, what do you have any protections around that or testing? Uh, so if we use the GitOps model, of course, because our uh, you can the only way you can add or remove those is if you log in into I repeat the question because they encourage uh, cause, yeah, on the recording, they might not hear it. So the question was, is how do we make sure that no one accidentally deletes uh, the entire thing? Because we have like one composition that controls everything. And if you remove like, all, of those, all of those compositions, the cluster will become empty and we'll lose all of our V clusters and all of our hosted Argo CDs. So 
in the GitOps model, and uh, basically, which uh, the the mo it's model with the Git permissions. So the only code donors to the repository is the bot user that uses that, that's used by the platform and ourselves. And no one has not not even our devs have uh, cluster admins on on this cluster on this on the hosted runtimes cluster. They have no re reason being there. Okay. <laughs> So this is how we make sure that's, yes. Can you pass the mic? Yeah. One question for, um, for the vCluster storage. Uh, where does the resources uh, for high level deployments and anything like that are currently stored? You, you, you show that you have access uh, inside the vCluster pod, but what happened if I restart the pod? Okay, so V clusters, uh, the, the the API actually V clusters are stateful sets. They have uh, PVCs, and if you restart the pod, the Kubernetes API it uh, reads back from the PVC and continues from the from the same spot. So you don't lose. It's not it's not stateless uh, in that sense. And they also have the possibility to use an external Postgres database, and you can then scale it out. Um, so under the GitOps model, uh, which you basically store all the like, if if I press the little button in your in your platform, you basically just create an, another YAML file in your big repository, and everything gets deployed. Is that the case, exactly. or is there any separation between? That's them? That, that's exactly the case. When when you click the button, our platform, like the bot user that uh, that's inside our platform, one of the microservices, it basically just commits this uh, YAML file. That's it. Fair enough. And then everything, like the, the repository is really locked down, so nobody can end up. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. Uh, one question. Uh, you mentioned that you had to do some additional hardening when you started using uh, virtual V clusters. Could you give some more details about uh, what you had to do? So just to make sure, uh, like the, the question was uh, what additional hardening we use uh, that, so that no one can access, like a, one customer can access another customer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the hardening, basically, what, what we did is like just to make sure that we cannot do inter-namespaces uh, net network calls. Okay? So just, yeah, network policies mm -hmm. and, and our quotas for resource isolation. And that's basically it, because uh, vCluster has its own API, there is no chance you'd able, be able to read a secret, for example, to, for a, a cluster that's a target cluster. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a question, how did you solve the single point of failure caused by the root cluster? I didn't hear. Uh, Okay. What happens if the root cluster have so, a problem? Uh, yeah, so, that's, so the question was, uh, how did we solve the single point of failure, like, which is the host cluster in this case? So everything is uh, fully GitOps. So if we want to, rec basically everything is stored in Git and uh, our model as well as the virtual Argo CDs and what they use, uh, which is like more code for specific stuff now, uh, but everything is like fully geared up, and even if the cluster gets deleted, we we have a, we have DR and we can spin it up on another cluster. We, we will in have some very short time. There will be some downtime. There will be if some da some downtime. Yeah, but yeah, uh, it's a question between you know risk and how much you want to to put effort on that risk. Do you really just have one V cluster then for each customer, or do you have V cluster replications so that in terms of a failure on one V cluster, you can switch to another V cluster instance or replica? We have, yeah, the question is like, uh, so we have a V cluster per uh, customer. Each customer has their own like V cluster. And Basically, it can uh, V clusters can scale out. You can use like external dat database, so it have must, has more than one pod. So if a pod restarts, it all leaves. Um, basically, like any other Kubernetes workload. Uh, 
Uh, how did you solve the problem with the noisy neighbors that you, that you referenced in the single cluster uh, approach? The question was, how did we solve the noisy neighbor issue? Okay, so V clusters have isolation modes and they're completely resource isolated. And v -class, because it's a different Cube API, uh, the neighbors don't really affect each other, right? Because uh, if, uh, for example, we deploy uh, CRDs for Argo CD in one, one V cluster, we can deploy a completely di different set of CRDs in another cluster with the same name. It wouldn't disrupt anything. It's like no noisy, noisy neighbor problem will, would really be prominent in, if we had like namespaces for each V cluster. And, and then cluster wide resources uh, would conflict and stuff like that. There are some scenarios that maybe, you know, we don't cover right now. Again, it's the same answer as before. It's a question of how much effort we're going to put, to put versus the risk that we're going to, to avoid. So if somebody does something, you know, strange or we have malicious actors, maybe they will do something. But do you have any problems with the, the hardware part? So in vCluster, you're still sharing the, the node, right? So how do you maintain that isolation between the, the, the vClusters? So the question is, like, how, how do you uh, manage to, if, we have, if, if one customer runs on just on one node, and you lose the node, and then the all the workloads are lost. So we use uh, pod topologies to uh, spread constraints on the pods. Those are also synced to the host cluster. And you can spread out the pods on uh, different nodes. Okay? So we, we spread those. So one customer doesn't get affected by a single node failure. And so everything remains up. You again? Come on, let's, let's give some. Thank you. So the question is, you said you could deploy multiple versions of Kubernetes. Uh, is there a compatibility issue when you deploy something that is deprecated between, so for example, PSPs uh, in the in the yeah, host cluster, and then you have the pod security admission controller and the, the downstream cluster. Is there some compatibility issue here? And yeah, the question was is the, if you have deprecation issues, like on the host cluster, if you deploy something on the V cluster that's deprecated on the host, right? I, I get you correctly. Uh, so you might get those if you sync some resource, but usually like what you sync is pretty basic when it's resources like pods and, uh, uh, and secrets and continuous, which are like mature features f forever. But in theory, yes, the deprecations can affect you if you, if for example, you use ingress v1 beta and the underlying, uh, like the host cluster is uh, uh, Kubernetes 125 and doesn't support those anymore. You, you could get that, of course. So, so vCluster is a brand new project on its own, and maybe you know this question is better answered by the vCluster people. But essentially, what's their the recommendation is you might have some issues, and they recommend maybe going one version of forward or backward. So if parent is x, you should have a child that is x plus 1, or maybe x minus 1, but not x plus 3 or x minus plus 3. That's the, the recommendation. I think we're, are we... So um, you use XRDs in crossplane, and to manage it, how do you test these XRDs? So you, uh, the question is, how do you test uh, composite uh, compositions in Coffers called XRDs? Um, so basically, you can create another version of the composition, and we do it a lot because we have uh, for ourselves we have a, a hosted virtual Argo CD deploy that we use internally. And we deploy a new version of the composition, and we switch our uh, claim to use a new version of the composition. We test it out on ourselves. We run, in, we run it in our production for a couple of days, and then we roll it out to users. You can, yeah, we, we use, uh, we have end-to-end -end tests for our, uh, and all of the components. We use Cypress, like anything, like any other end-to-end -end testing you would do. Any more questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, how do you manage the life cycle of the um, virtual uh, Argo CD into the, the V cluster? Did you hear the question? 
uh, sorry. Um, how, how, how do you manage the upgrade when, when you want to upgrade uh, Argo CD into um, uh, a V cluster? Uh, how do uh, which? But, um, I think the question is how yes. do we uh, how do we uh, manage upgrades of Argo CD? Yes, am, yes. am I correct? Uh, okay, so by, basically by creating a new composition version with the new Argo CD. In the, in the resources, like we just bump the Argo CD version. We again use a test composition, we apply it on ourselves, and we roll it out to customers uh, if we need to. Uh, basically, there's really easy upgrades. Any more questions? <laughs> Does the upgrade of uh, V cluster has some downtime? Of V cluster, say, Cube APIs. Again, louder, please. <laughs> Does um, the upgrading of V clusters Cube API have some downtime to the Cube API? So, uh, it, it does the Cube API for the V cluster have any downtime? Right? When we upgrade it, but we don't upgrade it. We do upgrade, we do upgrade if you want to bump. Uh, but it's rolling upgrades, so you, uh, you, you update like one pod and then another. Uh, you, you might get short Kubernetes downtime. all the way, Kubernetes all the way, think that way. It's Kubernetes inside Kubernetes, standard Kubernetes tools. You, you might get short downtimes if the V cluster is down for like 30 seconds, because the pods all run on the host cluster, you wouldn't feel it. And the problem arises with some CRDs and stuff like that, uh, but for short periods of time, it really doesn't affect uh, customers who don't feel it. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I was wondering, have you considered using cluster API? And if yes, why didn't you choose cluster API but cross-plane? And the question was, why didn't, why didn't we choose cluster API? As far as I know, cluster API is good for deploying uh, uh, Kubernetes clusters and cloud providers. I don't think there is an option to do something like uh, deploying V clusters. Uh, with with this uh, tooling, and we really needed like the V cluster thing. It was really essential here. I think cross plane when we did like the evaluation was a superset of what you know cluster API was offering. Maybe I think there is today V cluster support for cluster API. There was one presentation from uh, Adobe I think that showed this. But we started you know maybe one year ago, so maybe this didn't exist yet. Thank you for the talk. Um, we have sometimes hard time to, uh, troubleshooting and uh, debugging some uh, problems with cross-plane compositions, especially when they are not ready or healthy. You mentioned that you created your own um, node exporter for Prometheus to monitor those uh, cross-plane compositions, especially we have sometimes hard time with uh, sub-resources of the compositions. Uh, how do you manage and uh, what kind of uh, monitoring did you do to uh, debug those? So the question is on monitoring is uh, basically the proprietary exporter just uses uh, business met metrics. It, uh, it reads metrics from our platform. It doesn't like, access the V clusters even. Uh, v clusters, we, man we, we monitor them with Prometheus and we haven't had any issues with them really. Like we didn't see it necessary to monitor the V cluster itself. It was also always stable. We had no such issues. Uh, but you can, in theory, you can also deploy collectors inside the V cluster if you want to and have them report somewhere externally. I was thinking about, like, if, if we need to, I'll add an open telemetry collector inside as one of the components, and we will able, and we will send the metrics to one to some external Prometheus, for example. 